So we have with us Dr. Nupur Nerurkar, who is a laryngo laryngologist and voice surgeon at Bombay Hospital. And she realized that in India, we were really eons behind the West in the management of voice disorders. I'm going to refrain my BIS comment about talking and voice disorders till after her, her talk because we have enough talking here. But she has set up a voice clinic with state-of-the-art equipment at Bombay Hospital. She's also a full, was a full-time teacher and ENT surgeon at the LTM Medical College and Hospital. And she's going to share with us a little bit about what she does, Dr. Nupur Nerurkar, class of 1983. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. It's really such an honor to be here today. Yes, I was the class of 1983. And um, this, this is not the class of 1983, but these are the teachers. And that's Mr. Srivastava, who was our principal at that time. And um, there's Mrs. Bhavada, Ms. Dan Pantaki, and I could, I could speak about all these uh, teachers for 15 to 20 minutes, but I won't do that. I would, however, like to take this opportunity to thank all my teachers for two things. Um, for giving me the most wonderful school years, and the second thing is for instilling in me a lot of confidence, a lot of con confidence to do um, anything, really. It, it helped me in all spheres of my life, and that's something I think BIS does very well. Um, I am going to be talking actually on voice surgery, what we can and cannot do, um, but the topic you gave was good too. <laughs> I work in Bombay Hospital, and um, I'm an otorhinolaryngologist, which is um, a fancy term for an ENT surgeon, which is ear, nose, and throat surgeon. So I became an ENT surgeon 18 years back. And uh, for nine years, I just practiced ENT surgery. And then I kind of reached a stage where I was getting very bored of ENT surgery and routine ear work and nose work. And I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but I wanted to do something different. So I said, let me just go to the States, do a fellowship in something specialized. At that time, I was in Sion Hospital, and we used to get a lot of patients who would have trauma to the neck and the airway. So I thought maybe I'd specialize in airway surgery. So I went for um, a fellowship in laryngology to the States. But what happened to me when I went there was, it's like, you know, you have these movies where there is the world happening, and then there's this whole world under the water or under the ground, or I don't know. And it was really like that for me. It was like this whole world, and I was like, I can't believe this, that this is happening in my own academic line, and I don't even know about what's happening in voice surgery. There was so much happening, different types of surgery surgeries, different techniques, robotic surgery, laser surgery, use of botulinum toxin, and for some reason it hadn't gotten reflected back into India, because India really is, medically speaking, very good, and, and pretty much at the cutting edge. And, but nine years back, we didn't somehow, um, we didn't, uh, nobody had translated all this uh, stuff back. So I uh, got bombasted with a lot of kind of new surgeries. And um, I came back then in 2003 and decided that's really what I love to do and I'm going to do that. And so I then became what we call a laryngologist. So just dropped the auto and the rhino bit and I became a laryngologist. Now, in the West, really, uh, being just a laryngologist or just an otologist is more the rule rather than the exception. But in India, um, there are it's a very small group of laryngologists in India. I don't think the group could get smaller because there are two of us. A uh, very dear friend of mine, Dr. Jayakumar Menon in Trivandrum and me. So that works anyway for me as of now. Um, what we cannot do in voice surgery, I'll just talk about that first. So we cannot make you Sunita Rao, uh, or for that matter, anybody else. We also, unfortunately, we have a lot of uh, children and a lot of adults who do come with stammering, and we don't have a surgery to take care of that. There was a whole movie dedicated towards that, but we cannot do that. However, there are a lot of interesting things that we can do. But to do a good voice surgery, you need to be sure that you need to be doing voice surgery, so you need to diagnose the problem that the person has. And uh, one of the gold standards or diagnostic tools for diagnosing voice problems is stroboscopy. Um, stroboscopy basically, you know, you've all been to the disco and you've seen the strobe light. So you use the strobe light to kind of see the vocal fold vibrations in slow motion. Does anyone have an idea what the frequency of a male voice would be? Uh, you can take a guess what the frequency of a male voice would be, maybe a 
someone would, okay, it's about 100 to 130 hertz, all right? And you know that females are more higher pitched, right? So females are about 230, 260 hertz. And then children, of course, always better and everything, so they're around 400 hertz. So if you want to see these vibrations in slow motion, you use uh, this system known as a stroboscopy. And I'm just going to show you, I hope this clips don't gross you out, but I'm going to be showing some clips. And this is a stroboscopy of vocal folds of, of um, I can't find, okay, there it is. Of, um, this is uh, actually a, a singer in the opera who's Indian, but he performs in New York. And you'll hear him go from low notes to high notes. And what we see, and I don't, do we have a pointer by any chance? This is basically the right side and that's the left side. And the V, the v structure you see is the vocal folds. And when, when he's saying, you know, you, you're seeing a vibration which is taking place of the vocal folds and that's everything slowed down. So if there was a lesion or a nodule or a polyp or something, we would pick it up. And, and then now we have even more specialized tests, like this is known as an optical coherence tomography, which picks up a little bit of optical information in micromillimeters, puts it together, and this is uh, the OCT, not of the vocal fold, but of your fingernail. And, and so by using all these very fancy techniques, you can come to a good diagnosis of the problem you have. And one of the commonest problems that you have would be, a person who comes with hoarseness would be vocal fold nodules. Uh, let me just make a point over here. All of us lose our voice at some stage or the other because of a cough or a cold. So that doesn't mean you have a problem. But if your voice doesn't come back to normal within two weeks, that's when you need to worry, okay? So it doesn't come back to normal. And, you know, this is known as teacher's nodules, singer's nodules, screamer's nodules, because that's the group in which it takes place. And you almost never would need surgery for this. This is something you just give speech therapy, retraining exercises, and the nodules will disappear. So you do not want to do surgery for nodules. Nodules would form less than 1% of my surgical load. But vocal fold polyps, which now would look pretty similar, but is uh, just one side normally, you would need surgery. I'm going to show a small clip so you get an idea of what voice surgery is all about. So you see over here this red-looking structure over here attached to this right vocal fold. So that's the right vocal fold, and this is the left vocal fold. And this should play. Um, all right. Maybe I'll just escape and go into the main menu for this. So what I'm trying to show you is when we operate on the... Okay. Sorry, I don't think it's in the main folder, so we'll just go ahead. But when we're operating on the, when we're operating on the vocal folds, we're actually operating with instruments which are 24 centimeters long. And so the amount of precision which you have really is a little bit of hand movement and everything kind of moves. Uh, so in order to get a better precision, we use a lot of uh, laser surgery nowadays. And that's what the setup looks like. So that's the patient lying down over there. And we have a laser machine here, which is attached to the microscope over here. And uh, that's me sitting at the head end. And the surgery is all done through the mouth. So we're not doing the surgery through the neck. And when you use uh, a laser, it's like a beam which is going through the mouth and it's almost now we have these robotic lasers where it's not the robot operating you're you're moving the joystick so to say and so the precision and the amount of bleeding that takes place is very well controlled and where lasers has done remarkable work is in malignancy or cancer of the vocal fold because in India because of the tobacco use that we have we do get a lot of cases of cancer Fortunately, we're getting cancers earlier now because people are getting more aware of hoarseness of voice and coming earlier to doctors. So in stage one and stage two cancers, we can take care of the whole malignancy with the laser. So this is the pre-surgical and the post-surgical picture. And the patient just comes into the hospital for a day, is out the next day. And this is a sea change from how it used to take place 10 years back, where we did open surgery, reconstructed the food pipe, had a hole in the neck, and really the patient's voice was compromised and I hope this plays. I, well, so anyway, to show that was to show that the stroboscopy of the patient is almost normal after the surgery. This is another condition which we see pretty often. I think I'm gonna have to go into the, just bear with me because you know, you, 
would appreciate it better if I showed you the running clip. Now, like you get a paralysis of one side of the body, you could get a paralysis of one vocal fold. So this is the paralysis of the left vocal fold. And so what happens is that there's a lot of gap. So the patient's voice is like that because the air is all leaking out. And when that happens, the patient can't speak well, and the patient also very often will aspirate food and water because the water will just kind of flow into wherever there is a gap. And this is what the patient's voice would sound like. Uh, that's unfortunate. I thought, I was told that everything was actually running, but I'm going to go from here now. So this is a doctor who was operated for a neck tumor on his left side. And following that, his voice is really soft. That's why you're not hearing it very well. So it's a soft voice. He can't interact with his patients. He aspirates. Therefore, he's got a tube in his nose. So he can't taste any of the food you're making, Rahul. And so we need to get him to eat better. So what we do is a very simple, well, sort of simple surgery, where we need to basically push that vocal fold so that the gap is not there anymore. And we call that a thyroplasty surgery. So we take the silastic implant and we carve it. And we open up from outside, make a small window into the thyroid cartilage, and push the vocal fold. So you're not really operating on it. When you push the vocal fold, you kind of take care of the gap. And the entire surgery has to be done under local anesthesia, and the patient is awake. Because you are hearing the voice of the patient, and you're going to make that size of the implant vary depending on the best voice of the patient. So with the implant in, then what happens is that, OK. So we have the gap gone away then, and the voice of the patient also gets stronger. And I'd just like to show you what it looks like when we have the implant in, that the gap is gone away. And that's what it is like. And we'll also hear what the patient sounds like. And I think this is him following the surgery while he's on the operation table itself. It's a very I satisfying see. surgery because the change takes place immediately on and the see. operation table I itself. I don't hope so. I'm not sorry. We improved. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you say that again, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now take a deep breath and say E for as long as you can. Okay, uh, I'm going to now talk about uh, some fun surgeries. We can actually change the pitch of your voice. We can make the pitch more or we can make the pitch less. And why would we want to do that? Sometimes you, you, you hear men uh, who've got a very high-pitched voice and they almost sound like women and it's not appropriate for them. Uh, very often these patients can improve the pitch of their voice with speech therapy, but sometimes they can't. And then we do, you know, if you just imagine the guitar strings and you want to decrease the pitch so you make them a little less tense, you do exactly the same thing to the vocal folds. You just make them less tense by laryngeal framework surgery. And so I will make you hear the voice of this particular patient who's got pubophonia. That's what the condition is called, pubophonia, because it's at puberty that your voice actually changes. And if it doesn't change, then we call it pubophonia, and that's what he sounds like. I'm going to now let you hear his voice following surgery. So, even though we've counseled him that your pitch will drop, he came back and he said, Madam, my voice is very dangerous. And, and so, you know, but we had counseled him, so, you know. And then we can do the opposite thing, because sometimes you have males who become females, and then they want a more feminine voice in gender transformation surgery. And we don't have too many of them in India, but uh, let me make you hear the voice of a patient who uh, pre-surgery was... E OK, 
Okay, because we're running short of time, I just want you to hear her after surgery too. Where, here we've stretched the vocal folds, so she's going to have a more feminine voice. Say one to ten a little louder, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So my time is over. I had some more surgeries, but that's, you get the gist of things. Thank you so much. So we move from food to voice. Does anybody have a question? Would anybody? Yeah, there's a question, Jahan. So, um, after you have a voice changing surgery, is there a period of time where people can't say something that they used to be able to say? Like, is there an amount of time they take to get used to their new voice? That's a great question, John. What happens is in some of the surgeries, there is a loss of range, like the last surgery where we do a cricothyroid approximation because the pitch goes high. In fact, the range of the patient's voice then is a little compromised. So it's very difficult for them to go in a lower pitch. Similarly, where we do the surgery to get into a low pitch, it's very difficult for the patient then to go into a very high pitch and that the patient needs to be counseled about regarding surgery. So it's a great question. Thanks. There is a lot of counseling that would happen at each uh, stage. Any other question? We can take one more. So, yeah. Uh, hi. Could, could you tell us a bit about what smoking does to the voice box, even in cases where it doesn't lead to cancer? Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, before cancer, there are many things which happen. There is a dysplastic changes which take place, which are precancerous, and those are actually more common than actually smoking. Uh, smoking per se, of course, can cause orodigestive cancers all over the body. We know that. But you can have a, a type 1, type 2, type 3 dysplasia. And if you develop that, then your chances of developing an invasive carcinoma later on, even when you quit smoking, becomes higher. You usually, uh, I mean, you sometimes hear a lot of people where they're smoking heavily and their voice becomes very hoarse and deep. So yeah, something absolutely. happening to the vocal cord there is so getting damaged? Is, uh, no, it isn't exactly damaged, but can you imagine vocal folds ballooning up and filling up with a lot of water? So it's an edema, and there's a name for it known as rinkes edema, because that space in which the water fills up is rinkes space. And so um, a lot of singers actually take one or two cigarette puffs before singing because they want a deeper voice. I mean, I'm talking about the male singers. And um, the rinkes edema actually is totally non-malignant. It's not malignant, it never would become malignancy, but it's an edematous reaction, and that's what causes a very low-pitched kind of a voice. And if the person is very concerned about it, you can do surgery, but there's no point doing it if you don't stop smoking. Because if you do continue smoking, the rinkes edema is guaranteed going to take place again. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that was really very, very enlightening. <laughs>